I was going to ask Jeremy now to, and and Tim to show you our garlic. Um, oh, oh, oh. It's nothing to be nothing to be embarrassed about. Um, and um, what part of how we get that fertility is we've really moved to no-till here. We hardly ever till at all. We mow cover crops down. And if there's enough residue, we just plant in them. But then we also go to mulching. And we also improve beds with lasagna bed techniques. And Jeremy, will you talk about that and your experience? And yeah, like with this, we had a cover crop in the late summer and early fall, I guess, in probably October. We mowed it down with our little flail mower. And it was like really tall. It was uh, Sudan grass and cow peas and buckwheat. And I don't know what all else was in there. Um, and then we, we didn't even let it sit there very long. And we uh, just took a trowel and made a little hole and stuck each garlic clove in there. And then we went and got leaves and old hay and stuff and piled that on top of it. And it just comes up through the mulch. Yeah, that's, how we did, that's how we did the garlic. A lot of our other beds will take manure or compost of manure put a layer of that and then leaves and hay and maybe a few layers of that depending on how much we want to build the bed up. Sometimes we use cardboard like first we'll either hoe or weed whack everything way down and put cardboard and then manure leaves and hay and things like that and just let it sit there and rot and whenever you want to you can plant them in. And speak to your experience of what the effect of the soil is. Um, great that after a while you reach under there it's just full of worms and all kinds of life and then the soil underneath is just nice and loose and cool and moist and it's hard to see it when they go up there. Yeah. yeah we'll show you we have some beds that we did we we reclaim beds that way too like we have a bed that we now have melons in it really had a lot of johnson grass and other nasty weeds and by putting down layers of cardboard and lots and lots of mulch and, and manure and stuff, we basically reclaimed that bed. The only thing left, I guess, is nuts edge, right? Yeah. yeah. Which is a real tough one. Mm -hmm. yeah. So so you layer the manure in all of your um, mulches like that? No, just sometimes, just like sometimes. if you do the cardboard? No, don't, it's, don't always do the same thing. Sometimes it'll be just, just hay as a mulch or just leaves. Sometimes it'll be both. And, Kind of what you have available yeah. to use as a mulch. And depending it, on what we want to do to that bed, okay. like if we think it needs all that manure and stuff, then we'll put it on there. Is that coming from a soil test result, or you're just? We do soil tests, yes, okay. yeah. yeah. We do, and we factor those in, but it's not. We also do a lot of intuitive stuff. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, just by looking, knowing yeah. the soil. Yeah. Right, yeah. But we did this year actually, probably for the first time do an actual mineral adjustment in the greenhouse. We weren't happy with how our, our stuff responded to our inability to get together and get the sidewalls up quick enough. And we really got hammered by heat. Our plants just came to a stop and never came back. And um, we had Cliff Ruth out and he looked and said, boy, it looks like mineral deficiency to me. So we paid a lot of attention to our minerals and what we were really lacking in was potassium, which makes sense. We grow tomatoes in there all the time. You know, it makes a lot of sense. So we actually, went out and bought NOP approved potassium sulfate and mixed it with actually some biochar that we made and composted and applied it, applied it and the tomatoes you see growing are growing on those beds. I think they're doing okay. Um, so what, what's the input for the biochar? Chicken litter? Um, the input was compost. compost. Compost and we soaked the charcoal first in fish, fish emulsion okay. and then dried it down a little bit and then mixed it. You know, We actually made that. It's, it wasn't a high grade biochar because we just took it from our boiler and ground it up and just we wanted to try it we didn't use a lot and we did it because because we use a lot of compost and stuff our base saturation was way too high you know we had too many other minerals in there and there wasn't any room for potassium so the reason we did it was we wanted to get some uh, some cation exchange capacity in there you know and biochar has got a high cation exchange capacity so that's why we did it um, and it seemed to have worked you know we we now are due to do another soil test and then i wish we'd done one so we could tell you and guess what? We got it there, but we haven't done that test yet. We used to do the soil test in the fall, yeah, or the early winter. So you, so you put the biochar in the in the greenhouses as well. 
Pardon? You put the bio char We only did it in four beds, right, Jeremy? Yeah. Yeah, the beds that we saw were lowest in potassium that we we're growing tomatoes and stuff in. And now your question was? Uh, you may have covered it, but can you talk more specifically about soil building and rotation that goes on in, in this gutter connect? Yeah, that's a really good question because, of course, greenhouses, it's very hard to, to cover crop in greenhouses. It's very expensive space, right? And it's used, we grow winter food straight through the winter. You know, with no heat, we grow tons of vegetables all winter long. And so it's really hard to give up that space. But last year, we just disciplined ourselves. Jeremy and Rocco were particularly into it. Um, and they, we do a lot of consensus deciding on how we're doing it. And they're just like, we need to give this greenhouse a rest. So I'd say we had probably about 50% of the greenhouse and cover crops. More than that, 60%. We just grew cover crops into late winter, early spring. You know, into when we started. I guess it was mid-spring, right? When we plant, when we plant the um, these crops. A lot of these crops are going on beds that were cover crop. Mm -hmm. They got they got planted to cover crop in probably October and November, and they really they matured, they flowered, they did their they did their thing. Our goal now is to not ever have to take that much of the greenhouse out. We missed that space, but to really get better at we did we've done it some under -selling. As those tomatoes, you know, tomatoes, there's actually a, a term for it. You probably know it. I forget it. For where towards the end of the season, they start dropping leaves and that canopy opens up. We want to sow cover crops under them when that happens. Likewise, peppers, eggplants, things like that, beans. As they're widening down, we want to have cover crops growing under them. At that point, the cover crop's not going to compete. And the more stuff we have growing on that soil, the better it is. Because we know that the, plant, the plants are doing a better job of feeding the soil than we'd ever do. They're pumping food into the soil all the time. They're feeding our microbial community. So that's basically the way we're doing it. Would you come back in with a clover or when you talk about a cover crop under the tomato? Peppers, we probably would use clover. Yeah, we probably would use clover depending on when we did it. If it was late, if we weren't getting there until September, we'd probably grow a crimson clover. Um, though maybe that wouldn't work in the greenhouse. It might still be too hot. Um, but we've also <coughs> used red clover. It's not that hard to kill. Um, we use cow peas a whole lot. We really like cow peas, they can take the heat in the greenhouse, and cow peas have extra floral nectaries. And you know, we always are paying attention to trying to keep that food source up. We want the banquet or the buffet table for the beneficial insects to be loaded at all times. You know? so, so you don't solarize then, obviously. No, we don't. we've never solarized, really. Um, we could, but we'd have to solarize the whole greenhouse, so we don't want to take it down. And we haven't had much of a problem. We did have a pretty bad early blight issue one year, and it's just because People hadn't known how bad it could get. I wasn't really here full time yet. And they let it let it be infected in there. And so we had so many spores. We oxidated. People know what oxidate is? We put we oxidated the entire greenhouse and then we compost heat it. You know? And we basically took that infection away. You know? Yes. Um, what do you do with your tomato plant residue at the end of the season? We compost it. Compost. We compost it, yeah. Yeah, actually we remember when the Walmart and um, Lowe's induced infestation of late blight hit the whole east coast yeah. there was a catalog i really respect fed coast seeds saying not to compost your tomatoes and i challenged them on that and their theory was that you would have a tomato vine and i gotta turn my phone off i'm sorry you would have a tomato vine and stick it in your compost pile which would be warm and somehow it would survive all winter and that's not true here you know that's not going to happen um so we don't, we don't have any problem. We compost it. We're certain. You'll see our compost. We have no doubt that tomato's dead. And as you probably all know, late blight is host obligate. If it doesn't have a living host, it's not going to happen. You know? So we compost it. Yeah, but we compost it well. You know? The first year we did a worm box. I didn't get to show you the worm box. If, if on the way, as you're headed to, back towards the van, anybody wants to run over, I'll show you our worm box. We use the worm compost, the worm castings for tea too. And worm castings, if it's gone through the gut of a worm, there's no human pathogen or plant pathogen that survives. Where people get messed up is they go deeper than the castings and then there are pathogens. But if you just get the castings, it's a guarantee. Because the worms, that's what they eat. They eat microbes. So they grind them up in their dying little guts and they're not there anymore. Okay, let's head into the garden. Okay, so. Um, this is the main garden. I stopped right here because we always try and set it up and we come to the garden, we prepare you for the garden. What I mean by that is we have herbs here. And this one just got transplanted out of the greenhouse. It'll come out of its current bunk. 
Foam. Herbs here that are you know. highly volatile and lemon smell oils. And if you get in the garden and it's a, it's a buggy time, come on by and get a little grasp of this lemon verbena. Smell it. And know that if you were, had this at your farm, you could just take it, rub it on your hands. Don't rub it on your skin. Rub it on your hands because your hand, the palms of your hands can take it, right? And then very lightly brush that all over all your exposed skin. No bugs. And so that was real important for us to do because we had kids here last year, middle, middle schoolers who really hated the bugs and we had to give them the tools to not be unhappy in the garden. But also these are herb beds and flower beds. We try to have them scattered through the garden to keep our diversity up, to make sure we have a high level of beneficial insects. You know, I'll give you one example of that and then we'll move on to other stuff. Dr. McDonald tells a story of two Baconid wasps flying out from their, from their hatching, right? They're flying out, they're sisters, they're looking for some place to go. One stops in a parking lot, right? The other one comes to our farm, right? Okay. The, the one's in the parking lot and along comes a male because they always do, right? And they mate. That one lays 30 eggs and they're all male. They're gonna go looking for other females, right? The one that came to our farm, she lands on a broccoli plant that's in flower because we let our bro some of our broccoli go to flower. She has a great meal because she feeds on the flowers. Surprise, surprise, okay? Then along comes a male like they always do. She mates, she lays 300 eggs and they're all female. That if you have the food, you ramp up the level of predation massively. And you get mostly balanced. We have very few insect problems. I won't say we don't have some intractable ones, and I won't say we have them all fall, have, have them all solved. But we have most of them solved. You know, I just saw a survey that CFSA did about the worst bugs, and I looked at them, and there's a few I can't tell you why they're solved, like cucumber beetles but I know we don't have to worry about them. I can't tell you what's, what's controlling them, but I know you don't have to worry. Most of them, though, I can tell you exactly how we control them. Well, that doesn't help us much, Pat. Well, do, <laughs> do we have time? You know? <laughs> That's it. We will. We'll do a radio show on it. You can All listen right. in. Okay? We're going to film the class, you know? I mean, you know, it's just we don't have time. This is not, I can't give the whole class here. Um, okay. Um, Tim, as we come into the garden, why don't you talk about what you're what you see as your big your big role here? My big role. Right. Well, the main thing you love to do in that. Planting and canning. Right. That's what I love Tim's, doing. Tim's goal is to make sure that this food gets preserved. You know, we not only want to make sure that we feed the hungry, but we want to make sure that we have anything that can be canned. Canned. Yeah. And that last year was the first year doing it. How many how many jars did you do all together? I think it was like 700. Oh, wow. Yeah, and this Pints, year there'll be a lot more than that. A lot more, yeah. Yeah, a whole lot more. He's already, he already did how many jars of, of beets? 40. Yeah, if you got to try those beets, they're in there. You should try them. They're really spectacular. Are you, I, are you canning and drying? Just canning. Just canning. But we're looking at drying. We're, we're actually putting in a facility that is going to make biochar, and we have a kiln that's going to dry the wood so we make the char most efficiently. And that kiln, we're also going to have double as a dehydrator. So we will be drying too. Yeah. I do a lot drying of drying. A lot. Um, I have to squat.